Well, good evening. I'll give you a minute to take your seats. We'll just start out by saying, go Pokes. <laughs> I am so pleased to be back in cowboy country. It's so wonderful to get up here to Stillwater. I don't get up here enough, but whenever I'm here, it makes me so happy to be in that part of the country, to be with all of you people who know, no matter what the political experts or the analysts or the pundits say, Oklahoma is not a red state. We're an orange state. And don't anybody ever forget that. It's always fun to come back here to Oklahoma State University because this is not just where I went to school, it's also where I fell in love with Oklahoma. When I was growing up, I wanted to live anywhere but Oklahoma. And I came to OSU, and over the seven short years that I was here working on my undergraduate degree, um, I grew to love this state, to love the prairie where the land is mostly sky, to love the people, the way they were down to earth, hardworking, good hearted, people who were dedicated to their values and what they believe in. And I think that's what Oklahoma State is all about as a university, as a community, as alums. And I think all of those great values are exemplified in the people that we're going to honor tonight. I am so proud to be a part of helping to give out the highest honor that OSU bestows. And I'm so proud to be associated with people of such a high caliber. And uh, so I want to say thank you very much and just uh, for letting me be a part of it. And I'll just conclude by saying, go Pokes. And now I have to introduce to you, or I get to introduce to you actually, someone I consider a friend, someone I really look up to, somebody I think is just a hoot to be around, a genuine great guy, a John Marshall graduate, as am I. We won't sing the Bears fight song for you though. Yeah, we won't. But let me introduce to you, please, our president, Burns Hargis. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, see, see if you remember our yell. We are the Bears it's from John, John Marshall, Marshall, strong, John brave, and true. And then you go, what, 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 <laughs> what, 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 remember? His class had to do that because they couldn't remember the words. <laughs> I knew the rest of it. That's enough, Jennifer. <laughs> I know. I'm not very presidential very often. Well, welcome everybody. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, this is a really special evening and we have some very special people that we're recognizing this evening. Uh, but I want to recognize a very special person at the outset and that's the first cowgirl of Oklahoma State University, Ann Hargis. Some of you have heard the story, but I drove in tonight and Ann got her orange electric car back today from Kicker Sounds. So it, we've got, a, we got some sounds working up there at the Wilhelm House. Uh, you've heard the story because when I, when I bought the car, it was cinnamon red, uh, which of course doesn't work up here real well. And uh, I took it to Mako uh, to get it painted PMS 166 orange which is the PMS Pantone color that I wanted. The guy said, I, I can't do that, it's patented to OSU. And I said, you're kidding. I mean, you can patent a color? And they said, yeah, it's, it's patented to OSU, but we can get close. So what if you had a letter from the president of OSU? <laughs> he said, oh yeah, that'd work. I'm sure my manager would take that. I said, well, let me have a piece of paper. The guy just, <laughs> so Ann's in a red, he's, or orange guard, come in, yeah. Um, you know, uh, Ann and I have been here almost three years, and uh, somebody asked me today, do you, do you like it? And I said, who couldn't like being around 20,000, 20 year olds? I mean, it is the most invigorating, energizing elixir that I can imagine anywhere. And our kids are, they're dedicated, they're nice, uh, they're excited, and I, I kind of call it a confident humility. And it is a very attractive kind of quality that uh, makes our graduates special. And Ann and I have gone across this, I mean, when you're chasing a billion dollars, you've got to, you know, you really got to work at it. But we've gone all over the country. I cannot tell you how many incredible people we have met who are doing incredible things, four of whom are here tonight. Uh, 
and I'm trying to reconnect them with OSU, wherever they are. In fact, I was playing in a golf tournament out in California, and the guy asked me where I was from, and I said, I'm from Oklahoma. And he said, really, I graduated from Oklahoma State University. I said, you're not gonna believe this. He said, he said, what? I said, I'm president of Oklahoma State University. He said, oh my God, you found me. <laughs> so we are searching high and low. We have some very special people here. I wanna, and I don't know if Jennifer, Jennifer was gonna introduce them or not, but I wanna be sure and introduce my mentor and his beautiful wife, Ann, Jim Halligan. Senator Jim Halligan. And we have a lot of heroes from Oklahoma State University, but I can tell you there's none greater than a true American hero, General Tommy Franks. General Franks. Well, I didn't have to look around for the four people that we're gonna to honor tonight. They've been there from the very beginning. They've done a tremendous amount for our university. They represent our university everywhere we go. Uh, it's not hard to find people that deserve the Hall of Fame honor, but I can assure you that the four that we honor tonight deserve it as much as anybody ever could. So congratulations to all of you. We'll have a wonderful ceremony. Enjoy your dinner, and I'll see you afterwards. Thank you. Go Pokes! Isn't that just like Burns? You had to steal my line. All right, bringing this in, we're going to eat in just a moment, but first we need an invocation. And for our invocation this evening is Paul Cornell. He's here with his wife, Tabitha. He's chairman of the board of directors of the OSU Alumni Association. And right after that, right after this invocation, we'll have dinner. And uh, you may have the answer if any of you have wondered where the ducks went on Theta Pond. So, just so you know. <laughs> Times are hard. They're cutting corners where they have to. Good evening. It's my privilege to uh, be the third person to welcome you uh, to this uh, 2011 Hall of Fame dinner. What a beautiful night. The weather cooperated. Two weeks ago, President Hargis, it might not have been pretty, but uh, it worked out beautifully. It's a beautiful day, beautiful week, and some great people that we have here to honor. If you'll take a moment and bow with me in prayer. Father God, we come to you this evening with grateful hearts. We're grateful for the opportunity to gather tonight. We thank you for the blessings of freedom, freedom to live in this country, of freedom to assemble with these honorees and celebrate their lives and contributions to the world around them. We thank you for the blessings of friends and family who are gathered with us tonight. We thank you for the blessings of being in the OSU family. We pray for those who are suffering in this world. We pray for blessings upon them. We pray for the safety of those who are fighting to protect our very freedom this evening. Let us go out into the world with a view toward service above self and work to have a positive impact on lives around us. Amen. Well, if you have kids in grade school or grandkids in grade school, you'll all know this one, right? Oh, you do this. I'm going to do this, and then you're going to repeat it. You got, you got to do the same thing, though. You guys have no rhythm. Let's try it again. There we go. So whenever we have to restart, that's how we'll get going. The other one is lions and tigers and bears. <laughs> well, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce some special guests in our audience tonight as we get started again here. And uh, I would like, uh, as we go along, would each person please stand up as I say your name, and then if you would all hold your applause until we've announced everybody, and then we can, uh, we can appreciate them all together as a group. Uh, we would like to introduce Oklahoma Lieutenant Governor Todd Lamb and his wife, Monica. Oh, Burns Hargis has already broken the rules. <laughs> Okay, and then, uh, okay, well, let's just cheer as we go along then, shall we? Oklahoma State Senator Jim Halligan and his wife, Ann. Where are they? I think they've stepped outside. OSU Regent Calvin Anthony and his wife, Linda, were going to be here tonight, but I don't think they made it. Uh, Burns Hargis, okay, we've said hello to him. We'll say it again, Burns Hargis. 
There we go. And a big round of applause for the first cowgirl, Ann Hargis. Larry Schell, president of the OSU Alumni Association. Kirk Jewell, president of the OSU Foundation, and his wife, Jan. There's Kirk. Gary Clark, vice president of university relations, and his wife, Jane. Peter Sherwood, dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Barry Pollard. Board Chair for the OSU Foundation Board of Trustees, his, here with his wife, Roxanne. <laughs> Rex Horning, the immediate past, uh, past Chairman of the Board of Directors of the OSU Alumni Association, and his wife, Charlotte, there he is. <laughs> Dan Gilliam, Vice Chairman of the Board of Directors of the OSU Alumni Association, and his wife, Nancy. And if you were not on that list, go ahead and give yourselves a round of applause. We're glad you're here, too. We'd also like to thank uh, all of our sponsors for this evening's event. So if you would, turn to the back page of your program, where there is a list of all the generous folks who help make this evening possible. If you get a chance to let them know you appreciate them, we would appreciate that. Now, in addition to those listed in the program, you know what? Let's see. Did I get? Nope. I got everybody in there. And Tommy Franks. Wasn't on my list, but we've already said welcome, but let me say that again. I have a few things on my Palm Pilot, and uh, I think I've covered them. All right. In addition to those listed to the program, we would like to recognize for their support of the Alumni Hall of Fame, Gungle Jackson, Collins, Box, and Devil PC. Devil, Devol, where are you? Is it Devol? John and Jamie Longacre, Sigma Alpha Epsilon Fraternity in honor of Jean Batchelder, and Brian Close. We can give them a round of applause and tell them thank you. Thanks to all of our sponsors. I'm also proud to introduce to you this evening members of the OSU Alumni Hall of Fame who are with us. Will these individuals please stand as I read their names and please hold your applause this time until everybody's been introduced. So if we go ahead and stand and remain standing, Gary Sparks, inducted in 2010, John Linehan, inducted in 1995, Frank McPherson, inducted in 1985. Congratulations. We're glad to see you all. I'm glad you still know where your medals are. Now we begin this evening's induction ceremony with a man who is larger than life. He is a man who embodies the words of Bill Hybels. Visionary people face the same problems everybody else faces, but rather than getting paralyzed by their problems, visionaries immediately commit themselves to finding a solution. He's a man who's committed himself to excellence in all aspects of his life, his career, his family, and his alma mater. So if you would please direct your attention to the video screen as we take a look at the life of our first inductee, Jean Batchelder. A true visionary is someone who dreams big and doesn't allow constraints of reality to hinder ideas for the future. Jean Batchelder is a true visionary. Born on May 3, 1947 in Enid, Jean was the oldest son of Tilly and Arlie Batchelder. Gene's dad was the first person in his family to graduate from college, and he instilled the value of a college degree in all of his children. Gene was active in Sigma Alpha Epsilon at OSU and graduated in 1969 with a degree in accounting. He served briefly in the military before going to work for the Ford Motor Company in Detroit. After only three years, he returned to Oklahoma to begin what would be an extraordinary career with Phillips Petroleum. I think he just came in as an entry-level um, auditor uh, for the accounting division and um, just kind of started to rise up through the ranks after that. Gene's first son, Chris, was born one year after the return to Oklahoma in 1973. Stephen followed shortly behind in 1975. Daughter Annie completed the Batchelder clan in 1980. We were kind of that family in Bartlesville that went to everything. We went to every OSU football game, every basketball game. It seemed like a lot of times we were in Stillwater more weekends than we were in Bartlesville. In 1978, the family moved to Houston and Gene was promoted to manager of finance and administration for the Chemicals Latin America Division. 
They would again return to Bartlesville in 1980, where he would eventually serve as the manager of communications networks and computer services, guiding Phillips into the digital age. He was just so proud of all this uh, technology that they had put together at Phillips, and it really got him recognized within the company as kind of a pioneer and, and a forward thinker. I mean, this was back in the 80s before, you know, computers and, and PCs and stuff like that were prevalent. So um, I think that's something he's always been really proud of. Gene continued to thrive at Phillips, serving in various roles for the company and several of its subsidiaries. He was named Vice President and Chief Information Officer in 1999, and in 2009 was named Senior Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer. All the while, this larger-than-life figure exuberated excellence and personified dedication. I've been privileged to know Gene Batchelder through my entire career with the company, and he's provided significant contributions in the area of finance, information technology, commercial transactions, most recently, the administration side of the company. He's a valued senior executive of the company and a close confidant. He walks in a room and he commands attention. Doesn't even have to say anything, okay? It's just the way he carries himself. But then when he, he sits down, he listens and he has big ideas. He's a what if kind of guy. Gene's ascension at ConocoPhillips was mirrored by his involvement with the OSU Alumni Association. While in Bartlesville, he served as president of the Washington County chapter before joining the executive committee and ultimately the National Board of Directors. Gene's always had a passion for his alma mater and for excellence at OSU, but particularly a soft spot for the Alumni Association. Um, you know, he has season tickets to the sporting events and all that, but the Alumni Association is always where he felt like um, he could make a difference and, and just felt a connection with the mission of the Alumni Association, keeping our alumni connected for life. It was that connection for life that Gene and several other board presidents helped craft in the late 1990s at a time when the Alumni Association was searching for direction. When Gene came uh, as, as president, it was 2000. So basically he brought in a new century of thinking to the uh, traditional ways that we had done things. And, you know, it's funny, you think of, uh, we didn't even have a website back in 2000. And uh, he was, he was, he had this vision of what he wanted to accomplish and then um, made sure it happened and under his watch. And he got everybody pulled together and past and future presidents and we all figured out with the, obviously with the great staff, the Alumni Association, and we leaped forward and he was instrumental in that. Leaps based solely on faith weren't in Gene's game plan, and he made sure the Alumni Association had a solid footing to land on after its transformative journey. Combining two of his life's passions, Gene united ConocoPhillips and Oklahoma State University under one roof with the ConocoPhillips OSU Alumni Center. A dream for many years, Gene provided the connections that ultimately gave OSU alumni a place to call home. So ConocoPhillips and its predecessors combined um, are by far and away the largest corporate donors in OSU's history. And like I said, for the last at least 15 years, Gene's been the primary liaison in that relationship. Uh, he and Jerry um, presented a proposal um, that was accepted and ended up being uh, really what made the Alumni Center a reality today. It wasn't just let's do it, it was what is it going to cost, how are we going to get there, and Gene was extremely instrumental in setting that path, but he also charged us with, okay, put your money where your mouth is, and, and probably more than anyone, Gene put his money where his mouth is, and he challenged the rest of us, and we got on board, and today we're sitting in this beautiful facility that is um, so dynamic and it is the, the outward face of OSU. Gene was recognized by the OSU School of Accounting as a distinguished alumnus and inducted into the OSU College of Business Hall of Fame in 2002. He continues to support his alma mater by serving as a trustee to the OSU Foundation and serving on the College of Business Associates. Today, Gene and his wife Lori enjoy their ranch outside Houston. 
He continues his lifelong passion for golf while building an interest in hunting. Together, the couple enjoys their combined six children and 13 grandchildren. Family is a real passion for him, and that's something he's gotten a chance to refocus on the last 10 years or so. And Gene has seen many of his big dreams come true for his company, his family, and his alma mater. And we recognize him for his remarkable vision that will leave a lasting legacy for generations to come. You know, I was really delighted when Gene's name came up as a nominee for the Hall of Fame because of his long history in a relationship with OSU, his support in various roles through his company and personally, and with his family. Gene Batchelder has done so much for the Alumni Association, and it is so befitting that we honor someone who has given back so much and been so involved. And Gene, very proud of you, and we very much appreciate and thank you so much for what you do for our company and for Oklahoma State University. As long as I can remember, he's been serving OSU, even, even to the present time. And so there just aren't a lot of people that just give and give and give. And he just always seems to be giving to Oklahoma State. And so for the Alumni Association to have a chance to honor somebody like that, I think is very deserved and very valuable. And I know he's gonna be extremely proud. A true visionary who carried a great American company and a connection for life for OSU alumni into the 21st century. Gene Batchelder, 2011 Oklahoma State University Alumni Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, for induction into the OSU Alumni Hall of Fame, I present Gene Batchelder. I must have something in my eye. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. <clears throat> what a great video. What wonderful moments and great memories. Most, most of them, anyway. Uh, as a very proud Oklahoma State graduate, I'm deep, deeply honored. I want to begin by thanking the Alumni Association, Larry, and the University Burns. Thank you all so much. I want to congratulate the other honorees, John, Lou, Michelle, congratulations. How humbling to be in the presence of those individuals and the previous lineup of Hall of Fame honorees this evening. We are in truly great company. I'd like to take, if you will, just a moment to thank my family who is here with me to celebrate this evening. My wife, Lori, you saw in the video who now has a closet full of orange clothes that she wears very proudly. My daughter Annie, who Chris talked about growing up, was drugged to Stillwater to so many football and basketball games and her, and her husband Dustin. My son Stephen, who is half cowboy and half Texas A&M Aggie, and his wife Melissa. Uh, and my son Chris that you saw in the video, and his wife Angie, who those of you uh, here in Stillwater know they bleed orange uh, are our full-time Stillwater Cowboys. I'd also like to thank my brother David and his wife Sylvia who came in from San Diego to be a part of this uh, event with me tonight. And I know that at some point in the future I'll have a chance to reciprocate this evening for David. We also have a number of close, very close friends and business associates who are able to be here tonight. They're here because they know how important Oklahoma State is to me and my family. So thank all of you for being a part of this evening. And finally, I want to thank the special OSU family. Jerry Gill, Jim Halligan, Ike Glass, Kirk Jewell. <coughs> Kathy Laster, Rhonda Hooper, so many others 
who means so much to OSU and, and to me. These are special Oklahoma State friends who encourage me to get involved, to make a difference, to find ways to give back, and to encourage others. They, they have enriched my life. Thank you. Who could ever have imagined growing up in that small town Bartlesville, going to school at Oklahoma State, going to work for Phyllis Petroleum Company, could have wound and intertwined itself to create the foundations, opportunities, rewards, and blessings that have come my way. Opportunities that have allowed me to be a part of that special historical relationships and those heritages that have existed between OSU and Conoco and Phillips and now Conoco Phillips. Opportunities that allowed me to actually be a part of the dreams and efforts to bring the Conoco Phillips Alumni Center this amazing facility to life. Who could ever have imagined that little boy you saw in the video holding the hand of his newly graduated father some 60 years ago in Stillwater would be up here this evening. Dad would have been very proud. Thank you. This just in, the first cowgirl has tried all the desserts, all the different desserts at the table and votes the shortcake, her favorite. <laughs> These words were uttered by T.S. Eliot, who said, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Those words speak to the journey of a man who has explored the opportunities that lay before him all the while, never forgetting the place where it began. John A. Clerico's connection to OSU has remained strong over the years, no matter how far he's traveled or where his business enterprises have taken him. Please turn your attention to the video screen as we share in the journey of John A. Clerico. A true explorer will tell you a lifetime of experiences and travels can only strengthen the connection to one's roots. John Clerico is a true explorer. Born on July 17, 1941 in Bartlesville, John was the second child of Lorraine and Ralph Clerico. John's father was a longtime supervisor for Phillips Petroleum in Bartlesville, and John received an academic scholarship from the company to attend college. After serving six months of active duty in the U.S. Army, he arrived at Oklahoma State University in 1960. John pledged with the Sigma Chi fraternity, and the lessons he learned there influenced his life in many ways. Less than one semester into his college career, he met Beverly Smith, the first love of his life at the Sigma Chi Sweetheart Weekend. The two became inseparable for the next three years and were married in 1962. One year later, John graduated with a degree in general business. John's first career moves took him and Beverly to Kansas City and Chicago with Phillips Petroleum. The Clerico's lives changed drastically during their time in the Windy City when John accepted a position with Conoco and Beverly was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. The couple wasn't deterred by the diagnosis and continued to move about the country living in Minneapolis and Los Angeles where their only child, Diane, was born on Thanksgiving Day in 1969. The Clericos returned to Ponca City shortly after Diane's birth, followed by stints in Denver and Stamford, Connecticut. John's aspirations for an international position were finally realized when Conoco offered him the position of finance director for Europe, and the family crossed the pond in 1973. And they used to um, come back during the summer, and my Aunt Beverly and my cousin Diane, John's daughter, would come and stay with my grandmother where we were all uh, growing up as kids. John uh, loves his family. Um, I would say that uh, he, he, loves, he loves his family. Uh, he's very loyal to his family. 
In 1984, John left Conoco to begin working as the treasurer and chief financial officer for Union Carbide Corporation, one of the largest chemical and polymer companies in the U.S. It was at UCC when John's career was put to the ultimate test, after a massive chemical spill occurred outside one of the company's plants in India. John successfully guided the company through 18 difficult months, emerging as one of the most experienced CFOs in corporate America. In 1992, part of UCC was spun off to form Praxair, which specializes in industrial gases. John was selected as the new company's chief financial officer and oversaw Praxair's business operations in Europe and South America. It seemed no matter where John was working, he excelled. And I think he would attribute uh, his success to working hard, uh, always trying to surround himself with good people. I think he would say that uh, it's about uh, you know leadership, getting people to getting the people around you to focus and to have a clear and decisive mission. John retired from Praxair in 2000, and he, Beverly, and her longtime caregiver Angel relocated to Tulsa to be closer to family. Beverly enjoyed four more years of cowboy basketball as one of Eddie Sutton's biggest fans before passing away in 2004. I was so impressed with uh, the love he had for his first wife, Beverly, and uh, how he dealt with her illness. And uh, I think there'll be a special place in heaven for John Clarico because of the kind of husband he was to her. John's successes are not limited to the companies he has worked for. He is a dedicated philanthropist who has given both his time and money to numerous organizations. John currently serves on the boards of several prominent companies, ranging in focus from healthcare and oil to education and the arts. He also plays a major role in guiding the OSU Foundation, serving on its Board of Governors and its Board of Trustees. In that role, John is able to contribute to one of his greatest passions, his alma mater. Literally the first time I met him after the trustee meeting, he came into my office and he said, Kirk, if there's anything I can do to help, please just let me know. Two of John's biggest contributions to OSU have been to one of the school's most recognizable landmarks. Like many alums, John has very fond memories of the Library Plaza from his undergraduate days. It was a place where students met. In fact, he often met his future wife, Beverly Clerical, Beverly, at that time, in front of the fountain. And so when he realized that it was in need of some renovation after 50 years of wear and tear, he stepped forward and made a very substantial gift towards that project. On October 1, 2005, the Beverly Clerico Plaza was dedicated in front of the Edmund Lowe Library. The renovated plaza once again became a focal point on the OSU campus and will continue to serve as a living memorial to an inspiring couple that met upon its steps so many years ago. Exactly one year later at homecoming, John became reacquainted with his sister's best friend and sorority sister, Cheryl Blair. Cheryl and Beverly had been bridesmaids at his sister's wedding 40 years earlier. John and Cheryl soon fell in love and were married in 2007. The Clericos once again turned their attention to the Edmund Lowe Library to further support one of OSU's academic centers, making a $1 million gift to establish the Clerico family chair for the Dean of Libraries. It is one of the largest endowed chairs for any library dean in, in the nation. Uh, and I think it will benefit, it is benefiting current students and will benefit many generations of students in, uh, to come and it helps the library to be uh, innovative and future focused. John's support for his alma mater has also included a number of gifts to athletics, including the football and golf programs and most recently a one million dollar gift to men's and women's basketball. Everything that John is involved in, he wants to see excellence and so he has come alongside Mike Holder and the athletic department uh, to help promote excellence within their operation. Today, John and Cheryl reside in Tulsa and John continues to oversee several business ventures including Chartmark Investments with his nephew Mark, although his passions remain the same. Wine and OSU uh, and Sigma Chi. Uh, I know those are three uh, outside of family and work. Those are the three things that I know he's passionate about and also golf. He loves to play golf. Um, 
he loves wine. He's a great, uh, great wine connoisseur. Um, and then uh, he loves OSU and he loves Sigma Chi. And he's, uh, he, he usually contributes uh, both with his time, talent, and treasure uh, to the things that he cares about. For nearly 50 years, John has defined success as a financier in the corporate world and as a philanthropist dedicated to his alma mater and society's greater good. When he gives a gift, he wants that gift to inspire others to consider making similar types of gifts and, and to become generous donors and supporters of, of OSU. He's just a great friend of the university and athletics and I can't say enough good things about John and his generosity and willingness to give, give back. John's loyalty and his passion for OSU are very clear. Uh, he is an ambassador for the university. Um, he has, is always going to try to represent and make the university come out in the best light and do everything he can to make it successful in any way that he can contribute. A true explorer whose professional successes are only matched by his compassion and unassuming generosity. John Clerico, 2011 Oklahoma State University Alumni Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, I present for induction into the OSU Alumni Hall of Fame, Mr. John A. Clerico. Thank you. May I uh, just, first of all, apologize for some of those pictures? <laughs> Thank you all very much. It's, um, it's an important honor to me to be named to the um, Alumni Association Hall of Fame. And, and really, it's especially enjoyable for me to be able to celebrate it with family and friends and, and, and all of you. This is, we're, we're only part way through the evening, and it's a long evening, so I I promise not to burden you with a long speech. I do, however, want to introduce you to some special people who are here tonight uh, from my family, some of whom have, uh, have traveled a great distance. First person I'd like to introduce hasn't traveled a great distance. It's my lovely bride, Cheryl, who I think most of you know. Cheryl, stand up if you would. My very special daughter, Diane Deacon, my son-in-law, Brendan Deacon, and a very special young guy by the name of Liam Deacon, who's my only grandson. So would you all please stand? <laughs> Next, my nephew, who is technically my nephew, uh, but in reality, he's my best friend, my little brother, my personal physician and, and confidant, uh, Dr. David Kallenberger and his lovely wife, Jenny. Dave, would you stand? Thank you. <laughs> also having traveled a fair distance, my, uh, my brother-in-law, Stuart Bennett, my, uh, my little sister's uh, husband, Stu, could you stand? All the way from New York City, the Big Apple, uh, Cheryl's brother, Mike Elder. Mike, can you stand? As most of you know, I also have a very large second family from my, from my uh, almost 42-year marriage to, uh, to Beverly. And representing them tonight um, are two people who are very close to, uh, to me and have been with my family for a long time from Pahuska. Uh, Lloyd and Janelle Smith. I'm not sure where you are, Lloyd and Janelle, but would you stand? There they are at the back. Also here tonight are some very special friends of mine, a number of my Sigma Chi brothers. You know, among the large number of things that Oklahoma State has done for me over the years, one of the most important things uh, that I received was an introduction to Sigma Chi. 
Sigma Chi gave me a home here on campus while I was a student, a lifelong association of brothers who are, who are some of my best friends, and really most importantly of all, a set of, a set of ideals and standards uh, to live a life by. So I'm, uh, I'm very grateful for my association with, uh, with Sigma Chi. And I want to thank all the SIGs uh, who are here. Could, could, you, could all the SIGs stand? I can't see very well with the light in my eyes, but, but thank you all. You guys are the best. Thanks for being here. As the, as the video uh, showed, for most of the time after I graduated, I, I spent uh, a large number of years uh, moving around the world, chasing a, chasing a business career and, and trying to, uh, to build a family. But I came back to Oklahoma about, uh, about 10 years ago. And when I came back, I immediately was able to reconnect with, uh, with OSU. And while I've been back, I've tried to give of my, of my time and my resources uh, to the university. But I, but I have to tell you very honestly that I've received much more from Oklahoma State than I'm ever going to be able to, uh, to give back. And I want to just give you one example of that. Since I've been back, I've had the privilege of getting acquainted and building some relationships with, with some of our most uh, prominent alums. And I've very clearly been the beneficiary of those relationships. If you, if you know the Willie Nelson song we, we play at half times and, and during football games, um, my heroes have always been cowboys. Well, I'm a, I'm a living example of that. Some of the people that I've met here have uh, continued to be my role models, uh, my mentors. I'm sure most of them didn't know that they were my role models and mentors, but they were by their actions and character. They showed me the way forward many, many times. My heroes are people like uh, Boone Pickens, who's shown us all um, what philanthropy is all about. He's Oklahoma State's primary uh, benefactor. Not only has he inspired a lot of people, including me, to give back to Oklahoma State, he's shown us how to do it. I've heard Boone say on a number of occasions, there are two kinds of people in the world, givers and takers, and I, Boone personifies um, what a giver is, uh, is all about. My cowboy heroes are also people like um, Ross McKnight, who inspires me every time, every time I'm around him. No one, and I mean absolutely no one, has given more of, a, of himself to Oklahoma State than, than Ross. Ross shows me uh, constantly that if you approach your causes with passion and dedication, uh, you're bound to be successful. My heroes from Oklahoma State have also been people like uh, Burns Hargis, who after a long and, and successful business and professional career, um, decided to become our president. And he campaigned hard for it. But I can tell you he did it for one reason and one reason only. That was out of a sense of service. He dedicated himself to making Oklahoma State during the time he would serve as our president, the best land grant university in the country. And I admire that uh, tremendously. Just, just imagine what this world would be like if our leaders all had Burns' motivation and, um, and dedication to his job. And I, as I say, I admire that very much. My heroes here have been people like Mike Holder. Mike um, has a passion for excellence. He started with a, a golf program that he built from scratch all by himself. And now he's attempting to, uh, to build um, a nationally competitive and successful athletic department. Mike's the kind of guy who dreams of being the best and then sets, sets out to, uh, to, to accomplish it. In the process, I think, he sets a very good example for the rest of Oklahoma State. 
as Kurt said in the in the video, I get involved because I want I want to associate with people who have a passion for excellence. Mike has that, and he he shows the rest of the university what you can do if you have that passion for excellence. If we can be successful and nationally competitive in football, surely we can be in entrepreneurship, for example. My heroes have also been people like Steve Taylor, Gary Clark, some of the most accomplished uh, and highly principled uh, lawyers I've ever met, and I've met a lot of good ones over a long corporate uh, career. We don't even have a law school here, but we've produced some of the best lawyers in the state and, and, and in the nation. So those are, those are some of my OSU heroes. I highlight them for you because for me to think tonight that my alma mater considers me worthy of standing alongside such people in the OSU Alumni Association Hall of Fame is a very high honor and it means everything to me. So thank you to the association for the honor. Congratulations to my fellow honorees and thank you all again for being here. Mike Holder was always one of my heroes, too, because when I went to school here, our football and basketball teams were pretty terrible, and we used to chant, wait till golf, wait till golf, because it was the only highlight of the athletic year. Ooh, it, it's true. I'm not even making that up. Um, Lou Mybergen is a man who has a passion for agriculture and a love for his alma mater, and these two have come together to create a son of Oklahoma who epitomizes the words of Alfred Sloan there has to be this pioneer, the individual who has the courage, the ambition to overcome the obstacles that always develop when one tries to do something worthwhile, especially when it's new and different. If you would please turn your attention to the video screen as we pay tribute now to Lou Mybergen. It took true pioneers to transform a desolate prairie into a thriving state of agriculture, asserting its dominance in the field on a national and global stage, Lou Mybergen is one such pioneer. Born on September 5, 1931 in Enid, Lou was the first child of Mary Esther and Joe Mybergen. He grew up on the family farm six miles north of town and from the time he was born was surrounded by agriculture. Grandpa ran the uh, feed business and so uh, dad showed Herefords, I believe they were polled Herefords, but you know, through junior or through uh, uh, grade school and high school, he was involved in livestock. Lou's love of livestock and agriculture immediately drew him to Oklahoma A&M College, where he enrolled in 1949. He pledged Beta Theta Pi and was involved in block and bridle and a livestock judging team. Lou graduated from Oklahoma A&M in 1953 with a degree in animal science. He served briefly in the U.S. Army in Europe as a captain in the U.S. Artillery before beginning his career in agriculture with his uncle at W.B. Johnston Grain in Fairview, Oklahoma. Shortly thereafter, Lou opened his own packing plant and frozen food locker before he was called to duty again, this time by the governor. When we lived in Fairview, uh, Lou was working those, uh, his own business and, then, and running uh, Dale's uh, elevator. Uh, at that time, Henry Bellman was elected governor, and Lou was, uh, uh, pres uh, was appointed by Henry to be the uh, president of the State Board of Agriculture, was the title at the time. So we moved from Fairview to Oklahoma City, and he was involved in that Bellman administration. In his position under Governor Bellman, Lou represented Oklahoma agriculture across the U.S. and abroad in locations such as Brazil. When Dewey Bartlett was elected governor, Lou's career in agriculture took an interesting turn that would later prove to be very valuable. When Liberty National Bank approached Lou and asked him to be in, I believe it was referred to at the time as their Southwest Division, which was their agriculture uh, division. And so uh, uh, Lou, I think, uh, jumped at that opportunity. He, he, uh, 
He thought he would enjoy that because it was all about production agriculture. While working for Liberty National Bank and Trust and First National Bank, Lou continued his working relationship with his alma mater and the College of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources. I arrived here at Oklahoma State University on the faculty uh, in agronomy in 1976. And of course we were working with grains, feed and seed. And shortly thereafter, I met Lou Byberg. Uh, he has uh, vision, uh, strong vision. He knows where he, what, what he wants to do. He knows uh, how to get there. That vision began to materialize in 1976 when Lou purchased W.B. Johnston grain from his family, becoming the sole owner of the largest independent grain company in Oklahoma. It was Lou's prior experience in banking and finance that finally sealed the deal with his uncle, Dale Johnston. Lou's first year leading the company proved to be challenging. A new office in Marshall and a new elevator in Waukita were both destroyed by lightning within months of their construction. Lou also found that meeting the demand of buyers throughout the region couldn't be achieved in a timely fashion with the railroad capacity at the time. In true pioneer spirit, Lou turned his attention from the land to the water, specifically the Verdigris River and McClellan Kerr Navigation System in eastern Oklahoma. Johnston Enterprises first opened Fort 33 on the Verdigris in the early 1980s. The port allowed Lou to truck his products in one day to the river where they could be shipped to other ports along the Mississippi. But the big thing it, di it did is again open up markets, uh, both export, uh, export of wheat and other crops and the import of products uh, that, we, that we need here in Oklahoma. So that port's played a vital role in, in Oklahoma's ag uh, ability to uh, survive in agriculture. Since the opening of Fort 33, Johnston Enterprises has thrived. Today, the company has 22 grain elevators in Oklahoma and Texas. Its grass seed operation is closely aligned with OSU and has seen success not only in Oklahoma, but also around the globe. Uh, we've licensed uh, uh, varieties of seed varieties to Lou in different uh, capacities. And so all of that contributes back to what we're able to do in, in, our, in our division. And I think the most recent is uh, the Riviera. It was on uh, the Beijing Olympic baseball field. It's on several uh, college and uh, pro sports fields or practice fields. And uh, it's on several high school fields around the state of Oklahoma. Lou's support of his alma mater has gone far beyond grass seed. He is a member of the Dean of Agriculture's advisory board and, in addition to donating his time and services, has also given financially to support the next generation of agricultural leaders in Oklahoma. He's provided scholarships for students. Uh, he's provided a course of professorship for us uh, recently. And he's provided service in kind. Uh, to our project leaders uh, by donating uh, the access of land and or fertilizers and grain to be tested. He bleeds orange, you know. Yeah. He's, uh, you either have it in your blood or you don't. Lou has been recognized as a College of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources Distinguished Alumnus and as a Graduate of Distinction by the Dean of Animal Science. Today, Lou and his wife Susie reside in Lou's hometown of Enid. Both of Lou's children, Butch and Mary, followed in their father's footsteps at OSU. Butch now serves as Johnston Enterprises president, representing the fourth generation to own and operate the company. But it was Lou's pioneering spirit that led to the successes of Johnston Enterprises, the OSU College of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources, and Oklahoma's reputation as one of the nation's finest agricultural states. Dedication to family, dedication to Oklahoma agriculture, uh, dedication to uh, innovation. Uh, OSU, Lou bleeds orange, and uh, he has meant so much uh, to us uh, in our program. And so the, the word dedication to me is a, a word that pretty well describes uh, Lou Meinbergen. He's, uh, he's very honest. 
very uh, competitive person, as I mentioned earlier. He's sincere. He's genuine. He uh, just has Oklahoma agriculture in his heart. And so he wanted he wanted uh, Oklahoma farmers to be successful. He wanted W. B. Johnson Grain to be successful, and he he has a love for the university. He wants the university to be successful. A true pioneer who has planted seeds of innovation into Oklahoma soil, helping to transform the state's agricultural system and its premier land grant institution. Lou Mybergen. 2011 Oklahoma State University Alumni Hall of Fame. And let me say that Lou Mybergen is not just an inductee this evening to the OSU Alumni Hall of Fame. He's also a brand new proud grand, great grandpa of a little baby boy born today named Louie. And I don't know which he'll remember more from today because they're both a big deal. Well, I don't know what to say other than thank you. This is a great honor for me. <coughs> Pardon me. I want to thank all my family that are here. I wish they'd stand up. My wife, Susie, she's worked her tail off out here getting this stuff ready. <laughs> stand up, honey. <coughs> My son and his wife, Butch and Margie, and their daughter, uh, Madeline, and, uh, and the daughter, uh, Melissa Smith, and her, her uh, husband, Daniel, and uh, I'm getting lost here, Matthew Henneke, his grandson, his mother and father, Roger and Mary Henneke are here. And, uh, Uh, they said Joy couldn't be here this evening because he became a father this morning. But I do want to thank you for this. I, uh, I can't express myself as to what uh, Uncle Man and him has meant to me. Uh, I think, I know I owe them a great gratitude, a thanks for all that they have uh, done and taught me. Uh, I'm not sure of the count, but I think I have 32 OSU graduates working for us. So, <laughs> we are proud to be a part of uh, the university. And uh, I keep saying A&M because I'm an Aggie. No. <laughs> and and uh, I, uh, had all my friends here, the guys that helped me get in trouble while I was in school. I don't know where they got all this stuff up here. Cause these guys down here, y'all stand up here, you betas. They're the ones that helped me. They helped me. And I uh, want to thank Myra and Lou Ward also for uh, being here. They're, they're true Sooners. In fact, I'm married to Sooner. But I about got her chased over. At least got her in an orange blouse tonight. <laughs> but once again, many thanks. And uh, I hope that uh, I can continue to uh, support the universities we have in the past. And I'm sure my family and I will. Thank you.
was hoping he'd tell us the story of that kicking Appaloosa mule you had in the picture up there. Did you ever get on that mule? No, my grandson did, he got bucked off. <laughs> Good point. I always put the grandkids on first, and then if the mule turns out to be dangerous, she'll be all right. Our final honoree of this evening has made the world of softball her stage and represented her alma mater with pride, winning numerous awards and accolades, including two gold medals, credited with putting the sport of softball on the map. Michelle Smith has characterized what it means to be a true champion. Her life exemplifies the words of a, female, a fellow female athlete, Chris Everett, who said, if you're a champion, you have to have it in your heart. So if you would turn your attention to the video screen as we celebrate Michelle Smith. The word champion can be defined as the winner of a competition or an advocate for a cause. In either sense of the word, Michelle Smith is a champion. Born on June 21, 1967 in Califon, New Jersey, Michelle was the second child of Barbara and Ernest Smith. She grew up in the rural part of the Garden State and excelled in sports from the very beginning. In high school, Michelle played basketball, field hockey, and softball a sport she first enjoyed at the age of five. After playing for 10 years, Michelle started pitching. It was that change in position that would ultimately shape her career and lead her to Oklahoma State University in 1985. Pitching's very interesting. If you just throw hard, it's like playing a game of checkers. But once you start developing pitches and the mental side, it's like a chess game with a hitter. So she had lots to learn and she was a great learner and she excelled. Michelle received all Big 8 honors her first season as a cowgirl and was on track to repeat her sophomore year when a serious accident nearly cost Michelle her career. She had severed the tricep in her pitching arm and when she was rehabilitating that I think is when she dug in the deepest of her soul and knew she wanted to be a pitcher and not only a good one but a great one. Michelle worked extensively with the training staff at OSU to rehabilitate her pitching arm and returned to the field her sophomore year throwing three miles per hour faster. Michelle was named a Big 8 Conference All-Tournament Selection, an All-American Big 8 Conference Selection, and an NCAA All-American her junior and senior years. It didn't matter if Michelle was pitching or batting, she excelled. She had all the tools. She was tall, she was left-handed, she was a great hitter, a great pitcher. Michelle threw a school record nine no-hitters and won a school record 82 wins at OSU. But the highlight of her collegiate career came in 1989 when the Cowgirls took a historic trip to the Women's College World Series. The team was really good and Michelle was, you know, one of the centerpieces of the team, but the team was really, really good that year. Very balanced. And so it was exciting. It was exciting to be chased instead of being the chaser. So we had a lot of fun. USA Today named Michelle Oklahoma's College Athlete of the Year in 1989. One year later, Michelle graduated from OSU with a degree in health and wellness. In total, she set eight records for Cowgirl softball. You know, we've had some great players, but I think she was probably one of the first ones that really stood out as a pitcher and a player and got a chance to play worldwide. The world became Michelle's stage shortly after she left Stillwater. She joined Team USA Softball in 1991 and brought home a gold medal from the World Championships in Beijing one year later. She continued to earn awards and accolades with USA Softball winning three championships and two Pan American Games. But all of Michelle's hard work and dedication culminated in Atlanta when she led the United States into the 1996 Olympics. The debut came 10 years to the day after Michelle's accident that nearly ended her career. I mean, I was lucky enough to snag some tickets for the original 1996 Olympics, our inaugural Olympics, and, and get to watch her throw and our team play. And it was just, it was like a dream come true for all of us because we had all been players and had gone through so much. Michelle and Team USA became champions in softball's first Olympic Games, bringing home the gold in 1996 and again in 2000 when Michelle led the team in Sydney. You know, honestly, Michelle's just been kind of a pioneer in our sport. She's helped get softball to where it is today. And Michelle was revered not only by softball fans in the U.S., but also in Japan, where she played in the Japan Professional League for 16 years. I know the Japanese idolize her, and they, she is the Michael Jordan to the Japanese. 
Michelle is more than a champion in the sport of softball. She is a true champion for the sport. In 2005, the International Olympic Committee ruled that softball was being removed from the Olympic Games beginning in 2012. It was a major setback for a thriving sport, and Michelle has worked tirelessly to see it returned. Obviously, being the person who she is, she has a lot of influence when it comes to softball at an international level. Everything that Michelle's done, she's succeeded at, so I just hope that, you know, she's able to do this one as well. Michelle continues to promote the sport of softball to America's youth and hosts numerous camps and clinics every year. She has also produced a number of educational DVDs and books about softball and serves with a number of nonprofits to establish recreational baseball and softball programs for kids. You have so many players that are, prof that are professional players but aren't willing to give their time outside of the sport of when they're playing. And with her and what she's done for the sport outside of her just playing, I think the hours that she spends, the, the people that she represents, and the time that she has, that she gives up, is probably, I, I can't imagine anybody else having that type of timeline that she has, uh, uh, just dedicated to the sport of softball. Today, Michelle resides in St. Petersburg, Florida, where she has taken up training for triathlons and long distance biking. She is a passionate advocate for health and fitness for kids and adults, and also gives motivational speeches on women in leadership, team building, and sports training. Michelle is also a commentator for ESPN and a worldwide humanitarian representative for Musco Lighting. She has been inducted into the Amateur Softball Association Hall of Fame and the Oklahoma and New Jersey Sports Hall of Fames. Although OSU has never won a national championship in a women's sport, it certainly claims Michelle Smith as one of its most beloved champions. She is a champion for the future of softball and for the future of her alma mater, and we recognize her for her commitment to excellence for both. No matter what she does, she's excelled in every facet of life and in everything that she's, she's chosen to do. Never in a million years would people, would someone or or a softball player think, wow, I can make a career out of softball, and, and she's done that. You know, when you talk about somebody's work ethic, I think it shows in her successes in life, not just in college, not just nationally, but I think worldwide with her Olympics, with uh, playing professional ball over in Japan, I think her work ethic is, has proven that she is, you know, she's outworked everybody. She's just been a winner her whole life, and uh, uh, someone that has strived for excellence and achieved it, and uh, like I said, dreamed big and saw that those dreams come true. And I think that's what a university is all about. She's a living, breathing example of what can happen if you're given the opportunity for an education, especially at a special place like Oklahoma State University. So uh, we should be proud of her. And I think she's very proud of Oklahoma State. She's a complete person, more so than a complete player. Um, you know, there are a lot of really great athletes, but I think she always played with great passion and compassion. And um, it's taken her a very, very long way. And it's created situations for her to be able to help young people, our sport on the international level, and, and along the way to help Oklahoma State by giving us great exposure as being such a good ambassador. A true champion who excels both on and off the field of play. Michelle Smith, 2011 Oklahoma State University Alumni Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, I present for induction to the OSU Alumni Hall of Fame, Michelle Smith. Absolutely an honor to be up here this evening. Um, to President Hargis, uh, to the members of the Alumni Association, um, this is a very special moment for me and, and I really want to thank everyone from the bottom of my heart. Um, I also want to thank 
uh, General Tommy Franks for nominating me uh, to be up here. Uh, that in itself is, a, is an honor as well. And uh, it's been a uh, great opportunity to meet a wonderful person um, over the last couple of years, uh, meeting with uh, General Franks and his wife, Kathy. And um, every, obviously, everyone knows uh, what he has done for our country and um, uh, the way he led us after 9-11. But um, so obviously, he's very good at making decisions. And I have to say that I think uh, <laughs> his best decision ever made was to leave the University of Texas when he was younger. <laughs> And obviously to marry his wife, Kathy, who is an OSU alum as well. So let's give him a hand on that. <laughs> and actually, I would like Kathy Franks to, to stand up because she has definitely been the wind beneath his wings. And I think she deserves it. Um, as an athlete, uh, when we get interviewed, there's usually two questions that come up most often. And the first one is going to be, What's it like to win an Olympic gold medal? And the second one is, well, where did you go to school if the person interviewing me does not know where I, I went to school? And being from New Jersey, every time I said Oklahoma State, they looked at me in shock like, how'd you get from New Jersey to Oklahoma State University? And I would always go through this uh, little bit of a talk. Well, you see, I grew up in the western part of the state, and it is called the Garden State. You know, most people think, what exit are you from if you're from New Jersey? And I'm like, no, 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 it is. You know, there are New Jersey dairy cows, right? And you know, when you drive into Stillwater on Route 51 and you get over that last bridge, if you roll the window down a little bit and you take a sniff, I always smelled like home. You know, there's that pig farm out there. And I just knew this is where I needed to come to school. And uh, no, I'm just joking. But, uh, but um, I, I loved where I grew up in New Jersey. It was a very country atmosphere. And Stillwater definitely um, was a place for me to be when I was recruited by many different institutions. Um, it was a natural fit for me. Uh, and definitely the best decision that, uh, that I ever made was to, to come here to Oklahoma State University. And, um, and I, I, I know that as I look back now. I knew it when I was younger, but I, I absolutely know that as I, lo I look back now. And I think about my freshman year and when I arrived in Stillwater and I had to basically learn how to talk Okie because there were some things that didn't really translate from New Jersey to, uh, to Stillwater. And, uh, <laughs> like the, and it usually always happened every time I went into the QT. And um, I'd buy something, and they'd ask me if I wanted a sack. And I'd always be perplexed, because I didn't know what a sack was. To me, a sack was like a burlap bag. And my catcher, Lisa Harvey, um, who's from Bartlesville, would always translate. And she'd be like, a bag. You, do you need a bag for your goods? I was like, no, OK, thank you. I don't need a bag. Or I'd go in there, and I'd write a check for one of the many goods that I was probably shopping at the QT, because I didn't have a lot of time. I was either studying or playing ball. And then I'd be writing the check out, and they'd ask me for my tag, and I was like, did I leave a tag, a price tag on my shirt? I'm like so embarrassed. And, and she, Lisa again would translate, no, your license plate if you have a car. It's like, oh, no license plate. So, so I had learned what a tag was. Um, and then I would say to my teammates, well, I want to order a pizza pie. And, um, and I would just call it a pie. And they're like, I, wait, you, we thought you said you wanted pizza. I'm like, well, yeah, a pie. And on the East Coast, we call pizza a pie, a pie a pizza. And over here, that really wasn't the case. And just like I had to learn also that Soda is called pop here. I didn't really understand that either. And then we had Canadian teammates who called uh, sneakers tenny runners. And we had Mary Hammond from Wisconsin who called the water fountain a bubbler. So there were a lot of things that I learned <laughs> my first year here in Stillwater. But the one thing I learned that was probably most important is that on icy days, do not wear your ropers to, <laughs> to class <laughs> because you're going to skate there. <laughs> I think it took me about 30 minutes to, to get to my my first class on a very wintry, icy day when I had my boots on. So I learned to wear my, my sneakers on those days. Um, but definitely for me, uh, attending this institution was, uh, was, was an honor. It was a thrill. It was exciting um, in all senses of the word. It was stimulating. And it was because I was surrounded by great people. And I just, I can't, every time I think about the state of Oklahoma, I, 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 people ask me, really, what, what was it? And it was the people. It was the people that brought me here. And uh, Coach Fisher, thank you for everything that you did for me. Uh, I just, I, I can't say enough about what a wonderful uh, human being uh, she is and, and coach and the way she taught me. Because I was very young. I'd only been pitching for three years when I accepted the scholarship to come here. And um, I, had a, I had a lot to learn. Um, my teammates as well, Coach Fisher mentioned that. Uh, you, know, you can be a great pitcher, but if you don't have people behind you, to help support you. You're never going to go anywhere. And, and that's probably the best part of sports for women is that you learn 
to play together um, as a team and all the great things that sports do for men, they do them as much and more for women. And I, I hope everybody um, truly remembers that because I know you've all got to have daughters or granddaughters out there running around. So hopefully they're playing soccer or softball or basketball or something, but they're becoming strong, beautiful, healthy women playing sports. Um, so, but to my teammates, beyond special. Um, the athletic staff and Mike Holder, Amy Weeks, thank you for, for being here and for all your support. And um, the training staff as well, Doc Jeff Fair um, and Jenny Dix. And you heard a little bit about it in the video. I was involved in a, a terrible car accident after uh, my freshman year in college here. And I was basically told I would never pitch again. And because I'm just a little stubborn, <laughs> I wasn't going to let the doctor tell me I, what I could or couldn't do. If I wasn't going to pitch again, I was going to basically proved that to myself and I worked very hard and um, I had some great support though and the fact that this institution did not give up on me um, allowed me the opportunity to play in two Olympic Games and to win a couple of gold medals for the United States of America but the best part of it is it gives me a platform to be able to speak to young girls and children and to help inspire them and tell them to don't give up that you know what you look at Michael Jordan and or you look at athletes that are great at what they do and it's it's not easy we don't always get there and just fall out of bed and become Olympic gold medalists we work very very hard and we have to overcome some major obstacles and the best thing that ever happened to me was that accident because it really made me dig down deep and, and prove um, that I could pitch I wanted to pitch and that um, I could overcome anything that was put in my way so uh, I, again, I do thank this institution very much for not giving up on me and, and, um, and helping me come through that, that point and that moment in my life. And how ironic is it that 10 years to the day of that accident was the first ever Olympic softball game. So when I walked, when I walked on that field in Atlanta, Georgia in 1996, I felt like I won my first gold medal just walking on that field because I knew I was there for a reason. I was meant to be there. And, um, and then when we actually won the gold medal, I felt like I had won my second gold medal of those games. So, um, it, but it all started here at Oklahoma State University. And I, I can't thank you all enough. Uh, it is truly an honor to be inducted and to be associated with the amazing men and women in the OSU Alumni Hall of Fame. And this is something that I will never forget. Thank you very much. Maybe it's just because girls with straight hair want curly hair, and maybe girls with curly hair want straight hair, but is it wrong for me to say I want your hair? I just want, I want her hair. I want this hair. Well, on behalf of the OSU Alumni Association, we wish to thank the Alumni Awards and Recognition Committee for their hard work and dedication in selecting the members of the Alumni Hall of Fame. Members of the committee are listed in your program, and so thanks to all of them. Probably none of us know how much work goes into all of this, so we appreciate everything they've done to make this possible. Now, after the ceremony, all the inductees are going to be available in uh, Traditions Hall to visit with you. There'll be a photographer there to take pictures with friends and, friends and family. Congratulations to our newest members of the Alumni Hall of Fame, to their families and friends and everyone in the room who are helping to make OSU a university of, of excellence. And if you would now, let's all stand and sing our alma mater as the honorees are escorted from Click Hall. <laughs> 